will issue licenses and develop regulations outlining how and when businesses can participate in the new industry. As far as the agenda, we will have welcoming remarks by our hosts. We will have the pur purpose and introduction of our guest speaker. We will also have our guest speaker. We will be presenting a legal presentation of what automatic expungement is really about. And then we'll be host having closing remarks. I just wanna give a little bit of information regarding the Cannabis Chamber of Commerce and who we are. We are a recently established organization that is founded to foster trade and commerce in cannabis industry in New York State. Our members are solely representatives of those in the cannabis industry. And we're also looking to seek a financial institution that will ensure and have deposits for cannabis industries in New York State. That being said, I welcome everyone to this presentation. And now I would like to welcome and ask our assembly member from the 80th district, Assemblywoman Natalia Fernandez to please give us remarks. Thank you so much um, to, to our co-sponsors, to the sponsor of the bill of MRTA, our Majority Leader, Crystal People Stokes, um, and everyone for joining tonight in this really important conversation, this life-changing conversation. Um, it really was an honor for myself and I know many to be able to be a part of the passing of MRTA and not just to make marijuana uh, recreational, but to really undo the hurt that has been causing so many people for generations. So this is now the next step, the next chapter. We are looking forward to people's lives changing and this conversation will help us get to that better understanding and way to do so. So I thank everyone again for, for tuning in. Please take this information, share it with your friends, loved ones, anyone that is, has been affected by the law that was and let's get to a better future together. Thank you so much, Assemblywoman. Uh, next, we will have the Senator, uh, State Senator out of Harlem, uh, Senator Brian Benjamin uh, from the 30th District. Senator Benjamin. Thank you so much, uh, Yasmeen. And let me, let me just first say congratulations to the New York Cannabis Chamber of Commerce. No, I'm sorry, New York Cannabis, I apologize, Chamber of Commerce. Uh, for kicking this off, because one of the things that, you know, you asked me and I, you know, we've talked about is making sure that our community benefits once cannabis became legal. And to see this effort taking place and the, and the organization that you're helping to put together, I you have my full support. And I know so many on this call will help support as you help uh, br bring this out to the community. Let me also uh, join the summit member Natalia Fernandez in congratulating uh, Majority Leader People Stokes uh, for her heroic efforts in getting this bill passed. She can tell you the stories about negotiating and fighting with the governor and all of the issues that, is, that have been going on since I've been in the legislature, much less before that. And so I just want to commend her for her perseverance, for sticking to it and getting us to this place. Uh, I, you say what's next after automatic expungement. I think there's two things. First, we need to make sure that all of our young people know that expungement is automatic and that they are very clear on um, how any you know how they need to move uh, to go forward you know communication is such an important issue in our community that's why I appreciate what you're doing we're trying to get the word out to people and then secondly the next step is who's making the money right so who's going to be on the board of the uh, who's going to be on the can on the control board uh, who's going to run the office of cannabis management what are going to be the rules and regulations this is where the the rubber hits the road and I'm so glad that so many of us are paying attention. Um, and I want to play my part to make sure that people of color are able to get as much opportunity to be part of this growing business as humanly possible. So thank you for allowing me to say a few words. And uh, I'm, I'm with you all, all every step of the way. And call me anytime if I can help. Thank you so much, Assem uh, Senator Brian Benjamin, everyone. I know you have a very busy schedule. You have things to do. Um, but I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Uh, moving on, um, we'd like to now hear uh, some remarks from another host of ours that we are very pleased uh, to um, join, and that's the executive director of the Bronx 
Educational Opportunity Center, and that's Mr. Ronnie Hector. Mr. Hector, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Pleasant good evening, everyone. Thank you, Yasmin. You know, uh, Honorable uh, Fernandez, Honorable uh, Benjamin, uh, Honorable Jackson, and of course, Honorable People Stokes. You know, we uh, the Bronx EOC is honored to be a part of this conversation because we have so much to offer uh, our returning citizens uh, back to the community. And we wanna make sure that we have training programs and academic programs ready, available for them. Uh, we are the welcome home committee. That's how we look at ourselves at the Bronx USC. We welcome them home and we, we work really hard to find ways to ensure that they are trained and employed uh, and even own businesses as well. So we have a lot of work to do and it's good to all be here together looking at this and, and really figuring out how to collaborate with each other to make sure that we have a holistic approach to how we deal with our brothers and sisters as they come back into the community. Thank you. Thank you so much. So next we have another um, host who um, is joining us. We actually are um, very happy that she's joined. She's a community leader, leader out of the Bronx. And I just wanna acknowledge and please ask for some quick brief remarks of your thoughts in this community of what you think they need to hear. Ms. Althea Stevens. Well, good evening, everybody. I hope everybody's doing well. And I'm just happy to be here. And, and thank you, Assembly Member um, Ms. Jackson and um, Natalia Fernandez and Brian Benjamin and Mr. Hector for having me and Yasmin and everyone. So I'm just excited to be here to get this information and making sure that we're getting this information to the people that it matters most with. We know that this has affected our community in ways that that we are all still living with the, with the effects. So to get this information out and get it into the hands of the people that matter most is really important to me. So I'm just happy to be here and being able to get this information and share it with the folks that need it most. So thank you guys and I'm here to listen. Awesome, so much. So at this time, what I'd like to do um, this is a wonderful young lady uh, that I had the opportunity to meet, I guess, over the last uh, two weeks. <laughs> um, but I just want to first say thank you so much uh, to, this, to this lovely woman. And besides that, she has a story to tell um, in regards to the purpose of this event, of why we're doing this and why it's important that she wanted to host co-host this. But she also will have the honor of introducing um, our guest speaker. So first, let me give you all uh, our very own Assemblywoman, uh, Chantel Jackson. Yes, I mean, thank you so much uh, for, for being here and, and offering, to <laughs> offering to have this workshop for us, right? I have been bugging my majority leader since the beginning of time, just asking her for all kind of resources and information that I can get to my Bronx community because we know that the Bronx was hit extremely hard when it came to, um, you know, just marijuana injustices. We know that black and brown people were arrested uh, far more than our white counterparts when it came to the same plant that we all, uh, not us per personally, but all races, all ethnicities have utilized. There's no um, study that says that black and brown people utilize cannabis more than anyone else, but we disproportionately were being arrested, harassed, and thrown in jail facing sentences for the same uh, plant that white people pretty much were enjoying and celebrating in most neighborhoods. Um, so I, I bugged and bugged and bugged my, my majority leader, had a million questions because I was so excited about uh, where this would take us. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure I bring the, brought this information back to the Bronx. And of course we were trying to do an in-person one because the people who this really affects, like directly affects, are people who may not be in this space, may not join a Zoom call. And so it was extremely important for me to try and get out into the community and get this information to them. Um, and just so we, we're clear, because I, I love a little bit of dialogue. If you can drop a one in the chat, if you, have, if you know someone who um, has been arrested for a, on a marijuana charge. So I just want everyone to drop a one in the chat. If you know someone who's been arrested, a marijuana charge. And I know some people may not be able to see the chat, but the ones are just going up. The ones are going up. That means that a number of our people have been affected 
by by this plant that we have now legalized. And so I have the privilege of uh, introducing someone who has been an absolute champion uh, to, to this work. And I just want you all to know that in December 2018, our Assemblywoman Crystal People Stokes was elevated to the position of majority leader for New York State Assembly. Uh, she serves Buffalo's 141st Assembly District since 2003. She's a proud person, just extremely proud of Buffalo and always bigs it up. Uh, she was able to pass a law to decriminalize possession and the expungement of minor marijuana convictions in New York. But um, I just want her to know she has to update her bio on the Assembly website because now we have a legalization of adult use of marijuana and we owe it all to this woman, my majority leader, Crystal D. Peoples Stokes. And we would love to hear from you at this moment. Let's unmute. Thank you so much for that awesome introduction, sis. I, I appreciate it. And I will immediately speak to the staff about changing that bio because you're absolutely right. It's gotta be updated. Uh, what an honor it is. Uh, the other thing I want to say this to first, Chantel, is that you are absolutely right. This is a great thing to do virtually. And believe me, I have done tons of them since we passed this legislation at the end of March. But I am ready to hit the streets. We have got to get in the streets and talk to people about not just the expungement piece of it, but what the real potential is of it for, for people's lives. This could be transformational. Uh, either in the person who's in the legacy business or the person who is in some other business right now or the person who drives taxi cabs or the person who rides a bike delivering things. This could be transformational. And so I'm ready to hit the streets and I'm more than happy to come to the Bronx. Uh, more than happy when the time provides. Secondly, I want to, you know, really shout out my other colleagues in, in government, uh, Natalia uh, Fernandez and, and of course, Senator Benjamin uh, for their participation here. And I have to tell you about this uh, Yasmin Cornelius. This lady is, <laughs> this lady is really, I mean, she gets it. Six years ago, she and I had this conversation after I had introduced the legislation. And um, most people that I had this conversation with about legalizing a responsible adult use cannabis um, did not back, did not lean into it as an issue lean into it as an opportunity in the way that Yasmin Cornelius did. Um, she leaned into it in a way that I think brings her to where we are today. And so for all of the folks who are connected with the Cannabis Chamber of Commerce in the state of New York, congratulations. Uh, I see you growing so fast that you're gonna have to figure out how to control yourselves keep everybody in line but that's a good thing that's not a bad thing that's a good thing so congratulations uh yasmin and the remainder of your founding members i know melvin Lowe is one of the founding members i don't know who all the folks are on your board yet i know you're still recruiting in fact i have a couple ideas or some people that you can recruit um from the great city of buffalo who would be very beneficial on a uh, chamber of commerce that focuses on this issue for uh black people so uh, I look forward to working with you on it. Um, as has been stated, this, is, this legislation is uh, transformational. Everybody already knows that, and, and the Wall Street Journal has published it, by the way, that this is a $4 billion industry underground in the state of New York as we speak. And if it's that much underground right now, imagine what the potential is when it does become a, above ground and it's expanded on who has uh, more access. Um, so for me, it's more than about just getting access to that revenue. It's about changing the lives of the people who for multiple decades have been incarcerated, whose families have been destroyed, whose children have been without parents, whose mother have had to not just great grandchildren, but sometimes great grandchildren because their sons and daughters have been harassed and arrested for very small levels of marijuana. So there is no way you can pass legislation to legalize a product that everybody uses, as my sister Chantel said, but only a few people were incarcerated for it. There's no way you can do that. And so we had to have the records expunged. And so beginning in 2019, we, we started, we didn't get exact everything we wanted. And so sometimes negotiations are slow with people who don't understand what you need to do for your people. 
I'm saying they don't understand. I mean, I think maybe, maybe they did understand, but they didn't act like they understood. And so you're going to take what you can get uh, at that moment. And that's what we did in 2019. And most of the people who are eligible to have their records expunded automatically, uh, one ounce or less, um, most of them that has happened for. Some of them it hasn't happened yet, but most of them it has. But because you see how long that took in the 21 legislation, MARTA, we actually added resources to the budgets of the Office of Cannabis, Man no, I'm sorry, that one too, but for sure, to the um, Office of Criminal Justice Services and the Office of Court Administrations because they're the ones who keep the records on all of these multiple thousands of people in the state of New York who have been convicted of three ounces or less of marijuana. And so since they're gonna have the responsibility to automatically expunge these records, we knew it was fitting to put additional resources into their budget so they can hire staff to get that done. So it won't take as long as it did under the 2019 legislation. However, uh, there's some of us uh, in the legislature in, in my district in particular, well, we're not gonna wait for them to hire somebody in the office, in the office of criminal justice services or the office of court administrations. We actually went out and recruited um, attorneys to do a legal clinic on people walking in the door and helping them get through the process of having their records expunged now, not later. Uh, and those attorneys who volunteered, and they're really great people, and as a matter of fact, they're the same people who we organized three to four years ago who did for, for our community wills and estates, because you know a lot of our people don't have wills, we, we need them. These are the same attorneys that were now used to do our expungement clinics. And by the way, they also earn um, legal, legal credits. How do you call that? Um, CLEs. CLEs. They, they earn CLEs for, for volunteering to do this kind of work uh, in the community. So uh, I'm, I'm throwing that out there because that's also an opportunity that could, you know, could happen in other communities as well. So we realized that there's thousands of people who need to have their records expunged. We put money into that office in order to make sure that it happens. Um, in the modern language, it literally says that um, if you were charged with criminal possession of marijuana in the fourth, which is a 2221.5, uh, that's more than two ounces or up to eight ounces, formerly a class misdemeanor, you can get your records expunged. Uh, criminal possession of marijuana in the third, more than eight ounces, up to 16 ounces, formerly a class E felony, you can get your record expunged. And so on down the line. I'm sure your counsel there have looked at all of the legalese and how it impacts the communities where you all live. But these records can be expunged. Now, these records can also be destroyed, but that's the choice of the person. Uh, I know there was, we got a lot of pushback during the course of the negotiations on the legislation because some folks were concerned that it would somehow negatively impact our immigrant brothers and sisters. Uh, not our intention at all. Uh, didn't didn't want to negatively impact anyone. Wanted to have a positive impact on the people uh, of color who have been consistently in this country as American and had been, in, had been going to jail and losing the opportunity to raise and be with their families. So uh, expungement, what's next after expungement? I hope that you know, people will take advantage of this. And I already know that some people won't. And let me just be frank about that. Some people are not gonna care one hill of beans about it. But the vast majority of them will once we get the chance to talk to them so they can understand why it's important. And once they realize that you no longer have to stay away from your grandmother's house who lives in public housing, or your mother's house who lives in public housing, that you might have an opportunity to get a federal Pell Grant, that you won't have to check that box on an application anymore, that you may have an opportunity to get better credit, and you actually may have an opportunity to get better job. And so this could be like a second opportunity for folks who have been convicted, stopped and frisked and convicted, because you don't remember how this all happened. This is all purposeful, how we created all these jails in the state of New York, which we are now closing, by the way. And in fact, just full disclosure, 
in Orange County, one of the largest jails that had been closed is guess what they're applying for now? Access to marijuana. They're getting funded by their local IDA to grow, cultivate, and manufacture. I mean, this is no joke. This is what's happening here. And so the, the point I raise about what's next after expungement is the people who have their records expunged need to figure out what's their access to take them to the next level. Not to just let it happen and, oh, it happened, it's no big deal. It's a big deal. It's a big deal to have a felony off your record, a misdemeanor off your record. Take that and make something happen that's beneficial to you and your community, and quite frankly, in your family. And there are many ways, things you could do. And quite honestly, there are a lot of people on this call and in and around all of our communities who will help you do exactly that. So in the legislation, um, there is a 50% goal for people who are in the legacy business right now underground, ready, they should be ready to go day one. And because we put this 50% uh, equity goal in there, there's opportunities for them, or they can be women of minority owned businesses, or they can be distressed farmers, or they can be um, disabled veterans. That is the equity, 50% equity piece. And then after that, 40% of all the revenue that the state will earn as a result of sales tax will have to be expended into the lives, the people, the communities, the infrastructure, where all this harm happened at. In some ways, all of us know how those neighborhoods look because we all have them in our community. They all basically look the same. They look like the seven neighborhoods that were studied by Columbia some years ago. Yes, we will be familiar with that. They all look, they look like that in Syracuse too. They look like that in Buffalo. They look like that in Albany. So it's not gonna be find, hard to find the communities where the reinvestment needs to happen. And that's why there is not just a control board that's been established to manage how the licenses process will look, how the regulation process will look, but also who gets access to the licenses and who gets access to the, the multiple opportunities here. But there's also an advisory board that is established to help determine what happens with the 40% resources that gets invested into the lives of our communities. As you know, a lot of our communities have been gentrified. So the zip codes where the folks went to jail at might not be the same zip codes where they live at now. But that's not a problem because the Office of Criminal Justice Services and the Office of Court Administrations, they know where these people are. And so there's a connectedness and a way to figure out who can offer the services to them that they're gonna need to turn their lives around, should they decide to do it. Now, again, as I said earlier, everybody's not gonna take advantage of this, but most people will, that I know for sure. So this 13 member board, seven of which the governor has an appointment to, six of which the legislature has an appointment to, will make the calls on how this 40% of the revenue gets spent. It will have an uh, opportunity to weigh in on how the 20% of revenue gets spent on, on edu or not education, but um, prevention, uh, substance abuse, mental health issues, um, public education. You know, how are we gonna educate all of our uh, aging population, seniors who have literally grown up their entire life with this product being criminalized and stigmatized. Uh, Granny don't wanna hear nothing about marijuana is okay now because it's legal. She don't wanna hear that because she didn't grow up like that. But there is a process that we can help people get through if we do the right public education to understand that it's a plant. And it's not only is it a plant that is now available for responsible adults to use, but it's a plant that can add wellness and value to your life if you understand how to use it. That's the kind of public education that needs to happen. And we also have the 40% that'll be going into the school systems. And you know, I believe that the uh, advisory board will be the one that decides we don't need this going into the highest level school districts that get the best outcomes. We need this going into the school district that need the resources the most to add value to the children's life. Um, there's not a social scientist in America that won't inform you that if a kid's parents go to jail, there's a residual impact on that child. Simple as that. And that child could be 30 years old now. That impact is still there. We need to figure out how to help them deal with that. And so this is gonna be a deep dive it's gonna take a long time. It's gonna take committed people. 
And so uh, I'm committed and I'm asking people, you know, to, to stand in the fight with me. Uh, we're going through right now, trying to figure out how does the, the control board look? How does the um, advisory board look? And believe me, there are a lot of tons of people weighing in on that. So if you have a suggestion, save it for somebody else because I already got 50 <laughs> people to choose from. And I'm gonna go with that 50 and figure it out how, how to make that happen. Um, I'm happy to um, address any other questions that folks may have. I will tell you that um, there are a lot of people who wanted to see this happen for New York, but there are a lot of people who had a different perspective of how it should look. And there's value in telling people no. And you know what they want, you know what they want. And just keep telling them no until they realize what you want. And that's what we did this time. So I, I wanna honor my colleague, uh, Liz Kruger at this moment as well, because she carried the bill in the Senate uh, the entire time. And yes, it was a struggle, but every solid, single solitary moment of it was well worth it. And I am hopeful that uh, all of the folks um, uh, in my um, great state will take advantage of what's been provided for them. It is not provided for you to give it to you. You have to do something to get it. And that's another thing we need to make sure we may have people understand. Nobody's handing you anything. Nobody's going to hand you some money to go open a business. You have to start figuring that out for yourself. But you got time to plan. I don't think regulations will be in place before another year. So I'll end with that and be um, thank Yasmin and all the organizers for this fabulous opportunity to speak to you all and recommit myself to my colleagues that I will come walk the streets with you uh, to make sure our people understand what it, what this is and that uh, it was done for them. It was done for the people in Buffalo. It was done for the people in the Bronx. Um, and if you need to have more information on anything uh, specific, you can always feel free to reach out to my office. We're uh, in the Albany office. That's 518-455-5005 or in Buffalo. It's 716-897-9714. And of course, you all know Google. If you really want to find out more detailed email addresses, on, just Google me. It'll pop up. Nice to talk to you all. Stay blessed. You heard what she said. Just Google her. <laughs> Majority Leader, I have to say thank you. Um, I know that we had a long day, long session, and um, thank you for taking the time out to continue to have these conversations. She's been doing this for a long time, having multiple conversations in multiple areas, making sure that the people get the information. So I just want to say thank you again for blessing the Bronx with your My presence. My pleasure. <laughs> and we'll, we'll, we'll chat soon. Thank you so much, ladies. Uh, I'm telling you, we're going to keep educating people. This is not over. Uh, we have to continue this process. And, you know, uh, this is always going to be uh, a love, a labor of love, right? And so being that this is a labor of love, um, we just want to continue on uh, with this. I don't, I don't know if you're going to be able to stay with us, uh, Majority Leader, but if you are, um, okay, that's fine. But if there's any questions that folks really, really want to ask you, um, they haven't put it in the chat yet, but we'll make sure that your office receives those questions. Okay. I'll be more than happy to answer any questions folks have. Okay. Okay, so um, moving on, we are ready for our legal panel presentation. And so while, um, you know, I... Um, want to just say while we are switching our presentations, I want to acknowledge um, our panelists um, that will be presenting. Uh, first up, we will have uh, Mr. Eli uh, North Dortra, and he is with um, the Bronx Defenders. He's the Policy Council for Criminal Defense Practice. Uh, we will also have joining us uh, Ms. Emma Goodman. Ms. Emma Goodman, she is the, part of the uh, Special Litigation Unit uh, Case Closed Project uh, with the Legal Aid Society. And also with us, oh, he's going to kill me, um, Mr. Ryan uh, Munich. I did it right? Okay, great. And he is with... Um, the Immigrant Defense Project, he's a, he's a senior staff attorney. 
I want to first make sure that you all can uh, unmute your phones or, you, uh, excuse me, unmute your um, cells. Are you able to do that? Yes. Yes. Okay. So we're going to share your screen. And I kindly ask um, that you um, just say next and we'll, uh, we'll uh, address that accordingly. Does that sound right? Sounds great. So you please begin. <laughs> um, so I'll get started. So my name is Emma Goodman. Um, thank you so much for having me. And um, I'm very honored to be here on a panel with the majority leader and uh, the assembly and uh, Senate representatives that are here. So uh, thank you for having me speak. Um, I do expungement work and was very involved in uh, from the advocacy side uh, of getting the MRTA passed. And I'm very, very excited uh, to be talking about it. Um, it is an incredible bill and is going to do a lot to change things for the better in New York, but it is also going to take a lot of work, like everyone said, for people to really get the true benefits of it. Um, so uh, glad that people are here to learn how to get those benefits. Uh, next slide, Yasmin. Uh, so we're just going to briefly go over a few different things to give people a background about what the bill actually does. Um, I'm going to explain automatic expungement and how it actually works. I'll also briefly address the collateral consequences and employment that were addressed in the MRTA very carefully. And then I'll pass it over to Ryan, who will talk about implications for non-citizens. And then he will pass it to Eli to talk about changes in the criminal penalties under the MRTA. Next slide. All right, so we keep hearing automatic expungement. I put a flyer in the chat that has this information as well. Um, and the information is on our website. So on, under the MRTA, a bunch of things are now deemed automatically expunged. The list is here in uh, the highlighted box. There is nothing you need to do to make this happen. This is automatic. It is a process by the Office of Court Administration and the Division of Criminal Justice Services who keep all of our records. Um, they're implementing it. It's automatic, that's it. It's just gonna happen. There's nothing that you actually need to do to make it happen. And I'll talk um, a little bit more about what's actually happening now. Uh, just as a quick background, um, the kind of for ease of reference, if you were convicted of possessing up to 16 ounces or one pound, or you are convicted of selling up to 25 grams of marijuana, your conviction will be automatically expunged. Um, there are also a couple uh, controlled substance offenses for concentrated cannabis that will be expunged. Um, that will take some time because they actually have to go through all of those case files. It'll take a while. But next slide. So what does expungement mean and why is it so important? Expungement means that your case is vacated, dismissed, and deemed a nullity. It's like it never happened. Uh, what actually happens to the record is that the physical rec records, records are marked as expunged. Police DAs and other law enforcement agencies are also notified that the records are expunged and have to mark their records are, are expunged. And what's really important here is that you're asked, if you're asked about whether you have a conviction on a job application and your record is expunged, you can answer no. You do not have to disclose that information. Your case also shouldn't show up on background checks in general and should not be used against you in employment when you're applying for licenses, when you're applying for housing or in ACS proceedings. Uh, the only exceptions to any of this is that expunged cases will still show up if you're applying for a law enforcement job or if you're trying to get a gun license. Next slide. So here's the process. The Office of Court Administration has two years to actually make it happen, but they've mostly done it already. So the Office of Court Administration, OCA and DCJS have both applied what they call suppression codes to all of the Penal Law 221 offenses that are eligible for automatic expungement. So as of now, if you were to have a background check, those cases wouldn't show up. 
So they have to apply a different code for it to be officially expunged. But if you're applying for a job, applying for housing, and they're doing a background check, those cases already should not show up. One issue that comes up a lot is how are people going to confirm that the record is actually expunged and it's been done properly? Right now, the only way to do that is to request a certificate of disposition from the courthouse or to get a copy of your rap sheet, which means you have to get fingerprinted and go through the rap sheet process. Uh, there's more information on our website that will um, give you information about how to get your rap sheet or your certificate of disposition. You can also go to the New York Courts website and it will guide you through the process. But that's the best way to do it. Um, there are lawyers at my office and I'm sure uh, at other offices around the state that if you get your rap sheet or your certificate and you're confused about what it means, you can reach out to us and we'll help you understand what it says. Uh, one thing that is important for people to know is that technically under the law, the DA doesn't have to dismiss all of the cases, even if they would be expunged if you were convicted. It's a weird kind of loophole almost in the law. Uh, we think most DAs are going to dismiss those cases anyway, because it would really be a waste of everyone's resources and would be devastating for people if they had a warrant or something and got arrested for a case that would just be expunged if they ever got convicted. So we're hoping that that will happen. Um, we're waiting to see if it happens in the Bronx. We've been told it will happen in other parts of New York City. It has not happened yet, but we're working on it. Next slide. Okay, so expungement is automatic. You do not need to do anything, as I said. However, there are a number of reasons why you still might need a lawyer even um, even if the expungement is automatic. So the first one, and Ryan will talk about this in a minute, is if you are not a US citizen. If you're not a citizen, you may still need to file an application to have your conviction vacated, even if your record is being expunged. And Ryan will talk more about that. Um, also, you might need a lawyer if you have a marijuana conviction that's not eligible for automatic expungement, but is still a marijuana conviction. The law allows you to apply to vacate or apply to reduce your sentence if it's for a different type of marijuana offense. Uh, the court system is making forms for you to be able to use to do that. So you might not need a lawyer, but you might want to reach out to a lawyer just to talk about that and whether you need their help or not. You should also talk to a lawyer um, if you're considering requesting the physical destruction of your records, the majority leader mentioned that this is a possibility. Um, just talk to a lawyer before you decide to do that. There are situations where that could actually be very dangerous if the court records don't exist anymore. That doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, but just talk to a lawyer and make sure you know why you're doing it and whether it's going to be beneficial to you or not. And then also there are other ceiling laws and I will, I, I can't let the evening go by without mentioning one ceiling and expungement law that is currently pending in Albany uh, that, that might actually pass called Clean Slate, which is an automatic ceiling and expungement law for a very long list of offenses. Uh, some people might argue that in addition to all the things that the legislators mentioned earlier that are next after expungement, Maybe Clean Slate is next. Maybe we should be expunging more stuff than we are now. Um, so reach out to my office or to other lawyers if you think you might, if you want to find out if you're eligible for sealing or expungement, because your record, obviously, it's not only marijuana records that hold people back. Um, next slide. Uh, okay, so that's all I'm going to say about expungement. I'm sure there are questions in the chat and I'll answer them after um, when other people start talking or feel free to put questions into the chat. Um, I'm just going to briefly go over some of the uh, efforts at addressing collateral consequences in the bill. I put collateral consequences in quotes uh, just because um, in kind of we talk about collateral consequences as though they're kind of this collateral, this separate part of the consequences of having a conviction, having a sentence. But really, they are part of the punishment. And we, we know that, and that's why expungement is important, right? Because they're part of the punishment. They're part of why 
uh, the prosecutors want certain types of sentences, certain types of um, pleas, because they know that the consequences will be significant and will last forever. Uh, so a term that we use a lot more these days is perpetual punishment, because that's, that's really what we're talking about here. Um, and the MRTA really tried to address those types of perpetual punishment in real tangible ways by changing a, a number of parts of the law. So the first one it was in the housing context. The MRTA um, now says that unless a landlord would lose a federal benefit, um, they cannot uh, use marijuana use against you. Um, unfortunately, that includes NYCHA. In NYCHA housing, you cannot smoke in NYCHA housing. There's a no smoking policy because of connection to federal funding. Um, so that is one instance where it's not going to help in the housing context. Uh, it also addressed education, unless a school would lose a federal benefit as part of a religious-based no cannabis policy. Um, they cannot use marijuana use or consumption as a, a, a way to deny you education. You also can't be um, denied employment purely based on the use of marijuana and THC drug testing is no longer allowed. Um, it's only a grounds for denial in very specific cases where um, there's, it's connected to federal jobs. There are also certain types of jobs where they can still drug test you. For instance, if you're an MTA driver and it could potentially be dangerous for you to be using on the job, um, they could do drug tests. Um, in the ACS context, there were a ton of changes um, that were really pretty groundbreaking. So lawful cannabis consumption can no longer be the reason for a child welfare case at all. Um, prior restrictions for child welfare and foster care were also amended so that if you have an expungement eligible conviction that can't be used to deny you foster care or to become a foster parent. Uh, that's a really huge deal and is going to affect a lot of people. So uh, the short, short way to say that is for, you can't lose your kids for using marijuana. Um, and a lot of people have in the past. There are also, um, they also address professional licenses. You can't be de denied licenses for use or expungable convictions. Um, same with medical care. You can't be denied medical care um, for using and possessing marijuana. Um, and there, you know, there's obviously a lot more in the bill, but those are kind of the big picture things. So as I said, I will uh, be happy to answer anything in the chat, and I will now turn it over to Ryan to talk about um, this in the immigration context. Great, thank you, Emma. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm happy to speak about this tonight. Um, it is a groundbreaking bill. Um, it has a lot of good things in it. Uh, under federal law, um, marijuana is still illegal. And under immigration law, there are many consequences associated with marijuana convictions <clears throat> um, and use. I'm gonna talk about some of those in a second. But I guess the first thing to realize is that uh, under our kind of federalist system, the fact that the state of New York no longer criminalizes marijuana um, does not mean that um, the, the federal government has to honor that or um, give any type of consideration to that fact. So um, in the organization I'm from, Immigrant Defense Project, we do have a website with some um, general materials. It's just, I put the link in the chat, um, includes res uh, community resources and resources for attorneys. Um, you know, Emma mentioned that there is a vacater process. Um, next slide, please. So I think it's important to just talk to an attorney if you are not a US citizen. And so that means um, anyone who was not born in the US um, or does not have a certificate of citizenship or a US passport, um, you are at risk of being considered a non-citizen. Uh, so that's those are the people that should talk to an attorney um, in, in several different circumstances. So one is if you have an old marijuana conviction. Um, so you know, marijuana has been criminalized for um, decades. Um, I think 221 was enacted in the 70s. There is no statute of limitations on immigration law. 
So you can be deported for convictions, no matter how old they are, uh, even from the very beginning. Um, so if you have old convictions uh, under state law, those can be used against you in uh, federal immigration court or by the federal immigration agency. Uh, so you should talk to an attorney if you have old convictions. Another thing is that if you, um, just because marijuana is legal in the state of New York, does not mean it is legal in other states or, uh, as I mentioned, the federal government. So if you have legally purchased marijuana and you are stopped or arrested in another state, um, for example, and you are charged, you could be uh, facing immigration consequences based on uh, criminal legal contacts, even though what you did was perfectly legal uh, in the state of New York. And so that applies across a whole range of areas, right? So um, if you want to apply for a license to, uh, to get involved in the legal marijuana business and you're not a US citizen, even if you have a green card, even if you have a, a visa that allows you to be here, you should talk to an attorney first. There are many immigration grounds that do not require convictions uh, to have a negative effect. Um, and so being just being involved in applying for a license could have potential consequences. Uh, that also includes me a medical marijuana card, same thing. Um, and as a way to minimize kind of the risk of harm, again, despite it being legal in the state of New York, um, immigration can use against you things such as um, social media posts or photos with marijuana, right? Uh, that's especially true if you do not have status or if you travel internationally, but even without, if you apply to naturalize, for example, there's a potential of having negative consequences from that type of thing. Um, and that similarly goes, if you do travel, uh, you may be questioned by CBP if they have reason to suspect that um, you use marijuana. So that, you know, there is uh, kind of antiquated law that allows them to try to solicit admissions from you. So if you admit to certain conduct that is illegal under federal law, even if it's legal under state law, that could potentially create problems for you in an immigration proceeding. And again, that applies even if you have a green card, even if you've been here for 30 years with your green card, uh, nothing prevents them from trying to solicit those admissions uh, to use to deport you or prevent you from re-entering re the United States. Um, so, there is a whole range of consequences associated with this that unfortunately, you know, the state of New York can't address because it's, it's through the federal government. Um, and so if you are a non-citizen, and again, that's anyone who does not have, was not born in the U.S. or does not have proof of their citizenship, and, you know, so you may assume that you are a citizen. I think, you know, reach out to a trusted organization like Legal Aid, like Bronx Defenders to investigate that if you're not sure. Um, but anyone who is not a U.S. citizen could face consequences uh, from all these marijuana related issues. So uh, next slide, please. And I'll pass it off to Eli, thank you. Thanks Ryan and thank you, Yas thank you Yasmin for organizing this and, and asking me to be a part of it. Um, I also wanna thank the majority leader for her leadership in, in getting this really great groundbreaking bill passed as well as assembly member Jackson for bringing this to the Bronx. And um, I'm a public defender. I work in the Bronx. I've worked in the Bronx for the last six years. I've represented many, many people charged with possession of marijuana, even as, as recently as this year. So there was a real urgency to, to getting this bill passed. As was mentioned earlier, you know, although people for, for different races used marijuana for many, many years, only people of color really were getting arrested and prosecuted. So the fact that this bill actually repairs past harm and invests in communities was such an important groundbreaking thing. And I want to really, really thank those in the legislature who stood strong and, and made sure that that happened because we were advocating for it and it shows what ad advocacy and organization can really do. So I'm, I'm just going to speak briefly about changes to the criminal penalties. And I wanted to answer a question that was in the chat that was brought up by Vanessa, which, which Emma addressed a bit, but she asked why is it that DAs can still prosecute people for these marijuana offenses when they were open basically before the, the legalization was passed. It doesn't really make any sense for them to do it because even if somebody were prosecuted and convicted and went to trial, upon that conviction, as Emma explained, those, those convictions would be automatically expunged. 
but for some reason, district attorneys don't always move quickly to, to comply with these laws. Technically, the law is not retroactive. So if you possess marijuana prior to it being legal, they are still allowed to prosecute that. We're very hopeful that, you know, as district attorneys read this bill and, and kind of come in line that, that they will choose to, to really end up dismissing these cases. And we've recently heard from the Bronx district attorney that they, they do plan to do that but we'll wait and see when, when it actually happens. So what were the real changes to the criminal penalties? Basically, anybody over the age of 21 can now possess up to three ounces of cannabis legally inside or outside of their home. Eventually, you'll be able to possess up to five pounds in your home, but that, that won't happen for a couple of years once the regulations for home grow are, are put into place. You can also possess higher amounts of cannabis if a doctor has prescribed higher amounts. You can also, as of March 31st, smoke cannabis where you could otherwise smoke a cigarette, pretty much. Um, it's not illegal to smoke outside as long as you're not doing it in a place where, you know, consumption of, of a cigarette is, is illegal, like public parks. People can also give cannabis to each other if they're over 21, as, low, as long as no compensation is exchanged. So that's the basics of uh, the criminal penalties for possession if you're over 21. If we go to the next slide. This is a little chart that kind of just outlines the elevating penalties. So you can actually possess up to 16 ounces of cannabis before it becomes a misdemeanor. If you possess between three ounces and 16 ounces, it's a violation, it's a fine, it's not a criminal offense, um, but it, it would result in, in a fine. More than 16 ounces, up to five pounds is a misdemeanor, but above five pounds is a, is a class E felony, and more than 10 pounds is a class D, fel D felony. Next slide. So what about for people that are under the age of 21? It's illegal to possess cannabis under the age of 21, but it's not actually a criminal offense. The fine is a civil penalty and the fine can't be more than $50. You're also provided with educational materials and the opportunity to, to learn more about cannabis and its effect on young people. Um, but that penalty can't carry collateral consequences um, or result in any forfeiture of rights or privileges. The idea is that we shouldn't be, you know, uh, saddling young people with criminal records or any sort of any sort of record that could hurt them progressing because, because of cannabis. The MRTA, the, the new bill also places limits on, you know, using cannabis in probation, parole, or supervised release uh, situations. Basically, um, you cannot be violated for cannabis use unless that cannabis use is an explicit condition of your terms of release, and it's reasonably related to the underlying crime of conviction. So parole, probation can't just universally say to everybody, you know, you can't use cannabis. It's a legal substance now, and you can't be violated just for that use, and except in these limited circumstances. Next slide. This is a chart of the new criminal penalties for selling cannabis. It is a misdemeanor to sell to somebody who's under 21 years of age. There's an exception to that if the buyer and the seller are within three years of each other in terms of age. So um, there's a, a little exception, but otherwise it's a misdemeanor to sell to somebody under 21. It's illegal to sell without a license, but it's a violation. It's not an actual crime. It's, it does come with a fine. If you sell more than three ounces of cannabis to somebody over the age of 21, it's a misdemeanor. If the buyer is under 18, it can be a class E felony. So you know, if you're selling cannabis to somebody under more than three ounces of cannabis to somebody under the age of 18, you're facing a felony charge. Otherwise, you can see the rest of the charges. Selling more than 16 ounces is a class E felony. More than five pounds is a class D felony. And more than 100 pounds is a class C felony. All of those carry potential prison time. Next slide, please. So, just briefly going through a few other changes that were part of this legalization bill. And this was a really important one uh, that the majority leader mentioned. The odor of cannabis can no longer be used as a basis to stop and search people. We saw all the time 
um, police using that odor to, to basically harass people. Uh, it was probably the, the number one basis that police officers would say they used to stop people. Uh, after stop and frisk was uh, made illegal, it was basically mar odor of marijuana. And, and so that's not something you can see on a body-worn camera. It's something that's very hard to disprove. So it was used often by, by police officers. This bill puts an end to that in most circumstances. However, cannabis is still considered a drug under the vehicle and traffic law. It's still illegal to drive while impaired by cannabis or by the combined influence of cannabis and alcohol. So, you know, police can and will continue to use the odor of burnt cannabis when they're investigating DWI offenses. It's not legal to smoke in your car while driving because it can, uh, driving, just like it's not legal to drink in your car while driving. And so that's something to be very clear on. Cannabis was added to the open container infraction. So you, you can't actually smoke cannabis even in a parked car if that car is on a public roadway. If you're in your driveway, if you're in a private driveway, that's fine. But if not, it's technically a traffic infraction. But you know what? You can just actually step out of your car onto the sidewalk in most cases and smoke there. And that is not illegal. So just be aware of, of that restriction. Next slide. So that, that's the basis of our presentation. I know that there's a couple questions in the chat, which I'm gonna look at right now, but here's um, our contact information. Uh, you know, the Bronx Defenders is in the South Bronx on 161st Street in Cortland. Our physical offices are closed for the most part right now, although they will eventually be opening up. Our phone number's there though. We, you can reach out to us, call us if you have questions, visit our website. Um, you know, we're a holistic public defense organization for, for the Bronx. and um, so if, if you're also just involved in advocacy or learning what we do, please, please reach out. Um, and now we can address some of the, the questions. So um, Eli or Ryan, I think either of you could answer this. One of the questions uh, that Jake wrote um, is, uh, my understanding is that marijuana can still not be used on federal property. Um, is that true here like it is in D.C.? You know, I'm not actually specifically aware of, of that. I think, um, you know, Washington, D.C., I used to practice there, so I, I was aware of how, how it worked in D.C. There's a lot of federal land and there's a lot of federal law enforcement, um, different federal law enforcement agencies that operate in Washington, D.C. I would say I would err on the side of not having marijuana on, on federal property since it is illegal on the federal level. I don't know if Ryan has something to add on that. The MRTA doesn't address that specifically. Yeah, I'm also not aware of uh, the overlap. Before we, um, if I could just add one more thing before we go on to questions, I just wanted to allow the closing remarks uh, to occur so then we can continue on with the rest of the questions. Are you okay with that panelists? Of course. Okay, so we are pleased just to give a personal perspective and a closing remarks uh, so we can really get people in perspective of how to ask these questions or how to take action. Um, we are pleased to have joined us, um, Mr. Mikael DeVoe, and he is with uh, the Citizens Against Recidivism. And at this time, um, Mr. DeVoe, I ask that you give your comments and then after that, we'll really allow for questions and answers to begin and get right into it. But I think you can give us some perspective of how we move forward, because some folks might be saying, well, what kind of questions can I ask? I know there was some really meaty uh, topics inside the chat, but Mr. DeVoe, if you can. Dr. DeVoe, I'm sorry. Dr. DeVoe, if you can. Well, first, I'd like to say thank you for uh, the opportunity to contribute to this conversation and uh, highlight why the passage of this bill is important and thank the majority leader and the other members of the legislatures, including the lawyers who have worked on this issue. But first, it's always important for me to try to understand things in context. And I think what we first need to do is to highlight, you know, what a number of researchers and scholars have concluded about 
this war on drugs, because basically this issue related to to marijuana and all these uh, uh, the things that we've been talking about have emerged uh, in the context of the war on drugs. We know that a lot of uh, uh, scholars, uh, drug policy uh, 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 alliance, Cato Institution, uh, researchers, etc., have concluded the war on drugs is really an, was an utter failure. And not only was it ineffective, but it was also counterproductive in achieving whatever policy goals that the policymakers had both domestically and uh, internationally, as has been uh, touted in, in previous years. And um, what I understood in terms of the war on drugs, that we need to be perfectly clear about the elephant in the room that the real goal as had been expressed, you know, during the uh, Nixon administration was really, you know, targeting black people in particular. Uh, John Ehrlichman, who was uh, the chief domestic uh, policy uh, uh, chief for Richard Nixon said in an interview that uh, you want to know what the war on drugs was really all about? His words, the Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left, which they characterized primarily as college students, hippies and so forth and so on, and specifically stated, and black people. And he clearly said, Do you understand what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black people, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana, and blacks with heroin and so forth and so on, and then criminalizing them both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest the leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them during the night on the evening news, et cetera, et cetera, while specifically saying that this was about the war on drugs. So I just need to be clear about that because we need to understand things in a context rather than understanding them as this is something that's primarily related to, to marijuana. And it's always been a targeting of communities of color and how to undermine them, to disadvantage them, to disenfranchise them, and uh, basically to cripple them. And so the war on drugs has been racially biased in the United States. The unintended consequences of this is that all groups, as has clearly been stated, have not been affected equally by the implementation of policies related to drugs, marijuana, et cetera. And so we know that uh, it is well documented that these policies disproportionately affect minoritized communities, particularly uh, uh, Blacks and Hispanics. And it has, you know, as has already been stated, you know, just another way of, of, of instituting some other what might be characterized as Jim Crow laws, the new Jim Crow laws, which again has specific effect on communities of color. We know that uh, with these efforts that are now underway that people are trying to you know, right these wrongs by uh, legalizing, um, in this instance, marijuana. But you know, if you know your history, you know that cocaine was once legal. Uh, heroin was once legal, you know, they had cocaine and Coca-Cola. That's why was, Coke was Coke was it, <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, we used to drink it, you know, all the time. So, you know, it's, uh, history is important in understanding, you know, current events. You can't understand the moment unless you understand how did we get to this moment. And so uh, this war on drugs and its policy have been racially charged, has racially charged public policy for decades. And so now with this movement to legalize cannabis and the gain momentum, we have to also consider in a broader context, again, the whole thing about the war on drugs. And generally when I think about what's happening in this particular effort, you know, as I understand you see what's happening across the nation, people are engaging in, I guess, approach that includes criminal justice reform, uh, business ownership and support, addressing some health uh, uh, inequalities of health, health equities in the community, community reinvestment with some of the money that's been talking about, and also prison reentry initiatives. I see this um, this conversation about expungement as related to criminal justice reform. 
And of course, you can, uh, after having listened to a lot of the lawyers, there's a lot of uh, contingencies in terms of what the impact of this expungement might be. But it seems to me that a lot of the, the weight, sometimes it's being placed on the people that have been victimized by these policies. They have to do a lot of heavy lifting. They got to get the lawyer. They got to get this. They got to get that. Uh, might not apply here, might not apply there. So there's going to be a lot of confusion about the implementation of these of these uh, uh, efforts to uh, expunge a record. And I know, uh, at least I believe, that initially uh, uh, there's been a lot of conversation about sealing records. And I know people haven't, you know, made a clear distinction between the difference of having records sealed and having records expunged. Well, sealing, I know personally, having um, uh, spent a significant portion of my life in prison, that sealing doesn't mean anything. I went to Canada and got pulled over, and the first one of the things that popped up was what happened in 1973, 1974, a record that I had sealed. Well, I, I thought sealed meant nobody could look at it, but it doesn't mean that. It just means that, you know, uh, it, it really means nothing. People can pull up a sealed record and view that, uh, 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 it seems to me, uh, when they will. So anything less than wiping those records means that people will continue to have trouble with getting jobs, with getting loans, with getting access to higher education. Perhaps, uh, well, in, in New York, I know you can vote after um, uh, you completed uh, your sentence, but you know, it has already been alluded to, a lot of these invisible punishments, a lot of these ca collateral consequences of having these kind of convictions will still remain in place. So I think that, you know, as we think about uh, um, what's, what's, what we're trying to do on a broader scale, I think that we need to think about the, the, the reality that the, this, this war on drugs is really targeting uh, communities of color and we can't skirt around the, 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 uh, uh, those issues, uh, you know, in those conversations and think about how we can, um, uh, as we continue to do, you know, engage in conversation about deconstructing race, uh, which is another issue all in, 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 in and of itself. But I do want to at least uh, thank people that are engaged in, you know, some effort, you know, to right the wrong, but to, uh, uh, to be very clear about how from the very beginning, you know, these efforts were meant to undermine the uh, economic and social development of people of color and continue to, to, to do so. So um, um, I think that's the only thing that I could perhaps add that has not been clearly, you know, articulated uh, and how we need uh, anti-racist white people to be involved in, in deconstructing these, uh, uh, this context, which has made all of this stuff uh, 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 possible. So again, you know, thank you for at least allowing me to have this opportunity to contribute in some small way to the conversation, but it's bigger than just, you know, um, marijuana, et cetera. You know, it's, it's the whole, you know, uh, uh, attitude that uh, uh, fermented and uh, this war on drugs was really a war on people of color. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. DeVoe. Um, and we really appreciate uh, you sharing your insight. And this is just the beginning of you joining conversations, I'm sure, with this, uh, with this law and other issues coming up. And so again, your, uh, your commentary and your thoughts are well appreciated and um, considered um, um, scholarly. Um, your own personal experiences as well. Uh, so thank you again. I mean, I know, uh, just to end, you know, I yeah. work for an organization. We serve yeah. formerly incarcerated people. I'm a formerly incarcerated person, but sure. I think it's, 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 it's what has to be noted, the nature of the society in which we're living in. Sure. How the society in and of itself, uh, and the reason why a lot of these, these, these things are moving at such a slow pace is because primarily the people that are being targeted you know what I mean? The the the, the right. value that are being placed on those lives, and right. perhaps if there were some other segments of the population, we might uh, see some acceleration in the movement. 
Thank you again. Thank you so much. So what we'd like to do now is open the floor up for questions and answers. And I don't, if you have a question, I ask that you raise your hand or if we have questions in the chat, we can respond to them accordingly. We have uh, many of folks available to answer a question. Uh, my good friend, Monica Miranda, um, she will assist if necessary. And of course, if there are questions regarding legal, I'm going to um, yield to um, our legal team. That being said, I will first see if there's anyone in the, uh, anyone have any questions that you'd like us to uh, listen uh, to? Okay, that being said, Let's go on and continue what's in the chat room. Emma, you can continue that. So I think that we have answered any questions in the chat. If we missed anything, please let us know. Um, but I just, I wanted to thank Dr. DeVoe for his comments because I think it is really important to put things in that context. And, and I do think putting things in that context and understanding that history is why this bill passed and other bills that weren't as good did not uh, because people really understood the context of the war on drugs. Uh, and But I also, I can't let the opportunity, uh, Dr. DeVoe was talking about really looking at the perpetual punishment of a conviction and how marijuana is just the beginning of a war against people of color in this country. Um, and having that conversation and really thinking about what, criminality means and what what the legislature and the public really like their aversion to doing anything that helps people that are marked as criminals and why that is and what that means um, and how obviously that's tied to race um, I think that's important and I think that's a big part of the conversations we're trying to have around clean slate and why uh, clean slate and automatic expungement for everything, essentially, um, is, is what we need to, to kind of undo those harms in a real way and in a way that is meaningful to the millions of people with criminal records around the state. Uh, so I, I couldn't let the uh, yeah. opportunity to tie that in uh, <laughs> pass. You do, you, do, you, do good plug. You, do, you do good plugs, Eva. <laughs> We have a question, um, Marion Bell, how are you? Hi, I, I wanna make sure you can hear me, okay? Yeah, we can hear uh, you. And thank you so much, State Committee Woman Hurston for making sure that we are fully informed on this issue. Um, it, it concerns me uh, at coming up as a young person, but I also have a son who, you know, has had encounters with his friends and being young on co in college. And so I think they're very glad to hear that this is a change that's happening, right? Um, I do wonder if the legislation addresses any area of quality of life. Uh, I'm clear from the presentation that it does address, you can't stop people for smelling, um, you know, for the aromas. So I, I get that. What I wasn't too clear on is whether um, police or uh, businesses or churches, let's say, for example, have any latitude if they don't want to tolerate um, smoking outside of their facility. And I asked that question because I heard in the presentation that you can smoke it pretty much anywhere that you could smoke a cigarette. And then I began to think, okay, that's fine. But if it's outside of a church, you know, that could cause some friction between, between the same people that's trying to help is, is what I'm getting at. Has that been considered? And will there be any policy suggestions I think that's one of the education pieces that needs to happen. Uh, first of all, one of the things we always like to make clear, 
I hope you can hear me, this is Majority Leader People Stokes, is that this is an opportunity for um, responsible 21 year olders. And so I, I wanna believe um, much like Brother Makai just said that a lot of this incarceration was around a predestined thought process just to lock black people up. But at this point, I think that people will be responsible enough that they will respect Mother Jones Church if they're over 21. Now, if they're under 21 and shouldn't be doing it anyway, this law is not for them and there's nothing we could do about that. But as has been stated, that there are many clean air laws in the state of New York where you cannot smoke cigarettes. You, in the city of Buffalo, you can't even smoke cigarettes on a bus stop. So it depends on where you can't smoke cigarettes at, you can't smoke them there either. And then the other piece of that is a respect for your people. It's a respect for your community. Uh, someone over 21 years old standing in front of Mother Jones and Reverend Jones Church smoking cigarettes, that's not, that's disrespectful. And they have to be taught and have, they have to learn to do, to do better than that because at the end of the day, what we do always want is we want people to respect us just like we respect them. But if you're disrespecting them, you can count on them coming back to you. I, I, so I think for me, that's an education point. But we have to get to our younger people to say, hey, this is an opportunity for you not to be incarcerated for use of a product that you like. Use it responsibly. Be considerate of other people. Does anyone else, anyone else have anything else they'd like to add to that of, of making sure that they are mindful? Can I add to that? There was also a very distinct uh, explanation in the chat as well. Thank you I so was, much, Marion Bell. Go ahead, uh, Dr. DeVoe. Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly with the majority leader. I think that a lot of the community-based organizations that have uh, that, in, that encounter and work with uh, young people, young people deemed to be at risk of incarceration, um, um, can be involved in the public education piece in terms of informing people, just like I work with uh, organizations, we're having conversations that we never had in the past, what to do when stopped by the police. We never had to have those conversations. So you know, among the things that uh, community-based organizations can do is is let their young people know you know about the changes in the law how they should conduct themselves so that they don't get stopped by the police you know just make that a part of the general conversation and you have to agree with uh with the majority leader that you know in terms of in our communities we have to uh reestablish the notion of community you know wherein we're no longer afraid of each other when i was growing up if a if a senior walked down the block and you had a cigarette you would put it out you know, there's not that level of respect in the communities as was in the past, but, you know, the more and more community-based organizations, faith leaders, and so forth and so on get involved, you know, uh, I think that that, that that issue can be addressed that you, that you, that you raised. And, and um, I just want to add that, you know, the war on drugs, what the doctor was saying, and I think what um, the majority leader has set out in this legislation, is that we no longer have to, black and brown people have to try to get a seat at the table. We can make the table. And that's the important part. It's, 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 we are tired of, oh, let's get at the table. Let's get at the table. How do we get to the table? No, this is an opportunity. And with the organization that we, we are providing and the information and education we're providing, but the majority, majority leader has uh, put together for us, we make the table and we got to make sure, and that's why all of us advocates and people involved have, have to make sure that they don't take that table away from us because they will try. So that's just my two points. Thank you. Assemblywoman Jackson. Yeah, hi, I had to switch to my phone, but um, I just wanted to uh, reiterate what I said earlier about the message getting to the people who need it the most. Um, I'm looking at the people in this chat and possibly, you know, may or, we may or may not have had issues with um, law enforcement and marijuana, 
but we have to do a better job at getting it to our young folks, most, mostly our black and brown men to get this information because they're the ones who were directly impacted by this supposed war on drugs. And so whatever we have to do, if anyone has any ideas on how we can target that group, um, my office is more than willing and, um, and excited to hear about it so we can move forward with that. But um, I'm willing to stand on the corner and give out information if that's what's necessary. So I just wanted to put that out there. That's what's up. Assemblywoman Jackson, um, so that was a great idea. So we, if we get some flyers, we could, you know, as we do registration uh, at any of our EOCs, just 12 EOCs, uh, we could certainly put those in packages for, for folks to take home with them. Um, when we have our job fairs and our college fairs, we could certainly put that information in there as well. So, you know, the more we, the more we have opportunities to put that information out there, we'll, we'll be able to do that. That's excellent. Okay, so I, I also wanted to just point out while we're um, we're still accepting anyone else who has any questions, and if not, you know, we'll close out. But I, I just always wanted to say that what's not new to our communities is people smoking marijuana. People have always smoked marijuana. Uh, what's new to our community is an opportunity to gain access to this industry. Which is new to this community is the uh, social justice reforms that's part of this. And I think the more of us who have access, whether you are an elected, whether you uh, are not for profit, whether you are uh, uh, a regular person who has influence, um, is to share this information. I think the main important subject matter here is education, education, education. The majority leader said the most that she could do that we should be doing is educating our communities on what this impact is. Um, I don't, I think it, if somebody was gonna smoke in front of uh, Reverend Jones Church, they would have been doing that because we all know our people were smoking it ahead of time. But I do wanna say that this is also about upliftment. And I wanna thank you, Mary and Bell, for bringing this because I know that this is a topic that you have struggled with uh, every day. And I thank you for getting on this call to address this issue. It is so important. And if we could have your commitment in spreading the word, we would greatly appreciate it. I see your face going, all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, are there any more, are there, are there any more questions? You, you definitely have it. And, and believe me, I wasn't so worried about the church because mother so-and-so will come outside and shut it off. <laughs> That's true. That's true. I was concerned really about like <laughs> officers being called and not really knowing how to Absolutely. address the issue and the youth not really knowing how to, you know, address the issue. But I appreciate the answer, and I agree. It is about how we educate them how to address the issue. So, thank you. Okay. Uh, Yasmin, there was a question in the chat from Jake that he just put in there. What sorts of pushback do you anticipate will be coming from the police and some communities? Um, and I had responded to so Ms. Bell's question regarding what the police have been instructed on, there was a memo that was issued shortly after the bill was passed that was directed to all officers that kind of outlined what the bill said and the new, new legal requirements under the bill. So they have been instructed. They have all been notified. I, I have to say I'm skeptical that they will follow it to the letter of the law. It's my experience that when laws that are meant to protect people of color are passed, the police try to find a way around it and try to find some sort of loophole. That's something that, you know, Emma and I and all the public defenders who work to get this passed have been paying a lot of close attention to and will certainly be elevating and, and looking to combat. And we will come to the legislature if we see that there is a loophole and say, we need to close this loophole. Um, but I, I think that we all are kind of in agreement that this is the beginning of, of a fight. Um, every time a, a, a really good piece of legislation has passed, in my experience, there's an effort to roll it back. There's an effort to make it not as good that follows. So um, I know that we're committed, the organizers and the members of the Start Smart Coalition who really pushed for this and the legislators who fought for it are committed to, to 
fighting those rollbacks. And I hope we can get help from communities. I also want to offer, you know, I work for the Bronx Defenders. We're a community-based holistic defender. If uh, Assemblymember Jackson, if you need people on the corner, if you if any of people on this call are doing events and want you know your rights help, please reach out. I'm going to put my email in the chat um, because that we're here to to help do that, and that's part of uh, I think the responsibility in, in carrying this out. I'd like to mention one other thing. This 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 law does you know give us a, a great opportunity to start in a new direction in a lot of ways, but it does nothing to stop racism. Okay, <laughs> if we could come up with a law to stop racism, um, I'd say we're a little bit better than legislators because it's going to take <laughs> a little bit more than that. Um, we do live in a uh, racist, white supremacist caste society. It's been that way from day one. And I don't want to say that it's going to be that way for life, but I would say that thus far, that's where we're at. And so we have to take these little small steps to move through that, but we have not eliminated, eliminated racism at all. And there are going to be times when people will use their own racial thought process to implement a law or policy. In fact, there's not an agency that the state runs that people don't work in it that implement policies from a racial perspective on an everyday basis. And so do we have a lot of work to do yet on racism? Yes, we do. But this is one thing that you will not be able to stop and frisk people for anymore. And you might find some other ways to get around that, but we're gonna, we, we'll, we'll keep looking as well. And I would just like to make that clear because you know this is a great piece of legislation, but it will not stop racism. I, I think you're right. It's, this is an excellent um, piece and I think it's uh, progressive for to look at for the whole country, um, but it's not the savior. And I think that folks always put their buy-in on government. And I think that with the support of all of us uh, to monitor uh, and support uh, Majority Leader and Assemblywoman Jackson and Assemblywoman Fernandez and State Senator um, Benjamin, it's so important. Um, you know, if the if the government failed us 50 years ago, <laughs> what makes us think that we could allow this to happen alone without us having a, mar a monitoring aspect to it? And so I thought it was excellent when they thought about putting the legislative pieces of checks and balances in it uh, that allowed uh, a board, uh, a chief equity officer, uh, advisory board to make sure uh, that there's some uh, some monitoring and some support effort uh, to make sure that things are done right. Um, I don't think we should be thinking that this bill is it. I think we have to know that bureaucracy plays, still plays a role in this. We got a, a year, you said a year or so, a majority leader um, to get it right. I don't think black people should think that, okay, now I can start a business. If you don't have, if you start a business, you have to know how to be a business. Uh, and so there will be opportunities here to learn. I think some question, um, someone text me, uh, Majority Leader and Assemblywoman Jackson, about what, what if there were opportunities for funding and grants and things like that. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more on that? I can. So a part of the legislation allows existing registered organizations, which are basically um, providers who have medical marijuana license which you had to get three at one time, and you, so that meant you had to be highly capitalized. They have access to 10 dispensaries. We've added two for them to do adult use. But in order for them to get those two, they have to pay into it. So they have eight, now they'll have two more. They will have, they'll have a total of eight, I'm sorry. Let me see it right. <laughs> they, have ex they have the ability to do medical sites. They've been given the, the authority to have two more and they can be adult use sites, but there's going to cost them money to do that. That money will be used to fund the equity fund that will be then there to provide resources for that business owner or that person who desires to be in business that has everything right and needs a low interest loan or needs a grant or needs some technical support. And so it, it what's available is not gonna be the same for everybody because everybody doesn't have the same needs, but it will be resources available for those equity businesses to be supported 
to have that opportunity to get access to a license to be in business. Okay, thank you. Are there any further questions? Are there any closing remarks uh, that our panelists would like to provide? Yes, I'm going to just follow up on uh, our uh, <clears throat> majority speaker. The, the EOCs, the 12 EOCs have created a uh, asynchronous uh, entrepreneur program. And that is in response to this very topic of making sure that folks who want to be in business have uh, a place to learn about being an entrepreneur uh, and what it takes. Uh, we also uh, offer a suite of Microsoft programs in Excel and PowerPoint and Access to sort of really help folks with the uh, ma how to manage a business and how to write business letters and things like that. So uh, the SUNY Brown EOCs continue to do our part to make sure that we provide for underserved communities in that way as well. Okay, we actually have a question. Um, young lady, uh, Vanessa, you can unmute yourself. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you for organizing this whole thing, Yasmin, and thank you for um, Majority Leader and all of the presenters. This was a very refreshing meeting. Um, really, my question was just um, where can I get uh, resources about starting business in, uh, in the cannabis industry? Well, then my, my question would be for you, what part of the cannabis business do you want to be in? And let me tell you why I asked that question, because... Hey, it's very extensive. No, I absolutely understand, because uh, me personally, what I was thinking about was mostly cooking with cannabis. I've been working in the food and hospitality industry for the past seven years. And as you can imagine, with like COVID and everything, um, that has fallen through for me. But with these opportunities, and especially talking about heightening the society by adding in the cannabis industry with the rest of society. I want to um, implement cooking with cannabis. You know, that's kind of like my idea. So really that, yeah, like um, restaurants, as far there as will, like- there, there will be opportunities for you to do that. There, there won't necessarily be a license for cooking with cannabis, but there will be a license for a special, a social event that you're having where you're gonna be cooking with cannabis or using cannabis. There will be opportunities for like, I mean, I know community colleges in my area, they're already kind of strategizing around teaching culinary classes about how to do that. You could be, if since you already know how to do it, perhaps there's an opportunity for you to become a professor where you're teaching other people how to cook with the product. And then there's also opportunities, you know, somebody has to design your packaging Somebody has to do your marketing. So there are all kinds of opportunities that don't necessarily require mm -hmm. state license. It's just the auxiliary parts of this business. This is a, a brand new industry. And I think people just like you need to figure out what you like doing and figure out what your niche is in that area as opposed to trying to figure out how to pay the state for a license to be in business. Um, you know how sometimes you have to, there, there are gonna be what's called social consumption sites. That's a license because there's so many places where people can smoke, namely public housing, nights in the city. And there's just a lot of places where you can't smoke, where people still want to engage like that. Uh, so you folks can get a license for a social consumption site. That don't mean you can sell, you know, you can have wine there or, any, or alcohol, but that does mean maybe you can have a cupcake or a brownie. I mean, so there could be your opportunity there. Then that means now you have to have property you have to have property, you have to be able to pay rent. I mean, so it depends on what kind of business you're looking to get into. And I, I would say you should just keep giving some deep dive thoughts to it and stay in touch with Yasmin on this topic because yeah, I'm seeing this thing is evolving as we go. Chat. Yeah, I definitely want to stay abreast with everything, um, you know, with rules and regulations and, um, you know, what, yeah, like, you know, when you were talking about all of the, different outlets I have available to me, really understanding what's available and then understanding how to get involved in it correctly, ethically. Um, and yeah, and thank you. Thank you again. Like this has been inspiring and I'm going to look into, um, I, there was an email, um, this NY, um, NY Canna Business, 
Yeah, that's me. Jasmine. Okay. That's me. So check me out and uh, we, we will be updating everybody. Again, this is the first part to first find out that there are no barriers here. First of all, the, this bill has eliminate many, eliminated many barriers that the majority leader stated. And even though she's speaking from this voice from beyond, it's so encouraging, inspiring. I want to say that. <laughs> but the lawyers have broke down what happens, what will happen if you, uh, if you do things. You can't do things normally, but you can do things a new way. And so the same way that we're thinking about this is all no, please, I would have to ask everybody to be patient. And I say this because the ink is still fresh and things are still moving forward. Um, there's going to be a lot of changes. Um, and then we, we'll, I think they said, what, in about a year or so, you won't even see things happening until then. They have to still build the office up, hire people, create boards. But you have an opportunity now uh, to start what you want to begin. Yeah, I definitely want to get my feet in while I can. And if you guys are going to be out in the streets, definitely um, Co-op City in the Bronx. I'm pretty sure that's like already on your list, but uh, the people here will definitely be able to receive that information. Um, they need it. So I want to also say, please check the chat. It's really informative information. Uh, coming to you from the office of the majority leader. And um, again, uh, I think we're gonna, I think we can close this out. I wanna also uh, ask if the first, if the majority leader, if you have any closing remarks and then ask Assemblywoman Jackson, if you have any closing remarks before we um, end this. Okay. To um, share with you and your listeners. Um, and, and I want to let you know how proud I am of you all who are seeing the visionary aspect of this. This is a business. Um, it's an existing business. It's going to be a big business above ground. And it really just makes sense for people who look like us to jump off in it and figure out how we land and figure out how people who we care about in, our, in and around our communities land. Um, we try to put all the pieces in place. I believe we have them. Uh, now we just need people to prepare themselves to get there. And because you have, and your board and Melvin have started this organization around um, cannabis chamber of commerce, that's just, that's huge. And so I think of, 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 of maintaining the focus on that, obviously working with your legal community and your returning citizens community uh, you got everything all lined up to be ready. So when the state comes up with licenses, whether it's a year or whether it's 18 months, um, people who are affiliated with your cannabis chamber of commerce can hit the ground running filling out that application. Or you can have multiple people who are prepared to help them fill out the application and to do what it takes to help them get it done right. Uh, and I will just say this, if you want to figure out how application process could maybe look under um, marijuana, Look at what it takes to complete a medical marijuana license. You can find that in the health department, which by the way, it, that's gonna get moved to the office of cannabis management. And the same thing with hemp, you can find that in the agriculture department. That's gonna get moved from agriculture to the office of cannabis management. So this plant will be managed under one office, one agency as opposed to three. With that, I'll close and thank again for the opportunity to be, in, to be with you all. It's our honor, Assemblywoman Jackson. I mean, I feel like we said it all tonight. Um, this is just the beginning, though, because the next step is making sure that we create Black wealth around this same plant that has been criminalizing our people. So trust and believe that we will have more conversations around the licenses and different types of businesses, because it's not just, and I'm sure this was said already, it's not just about, about dispensaries. Transportation has to happen, right? You have packaging has to happen. There's going to be so much business around um, this one plant. And so we want to make sure that we create black wealth from uh, the same thing that has been ravaging our, our community. So I just want to thank all, everyone who listened in, everyone who was a part of creating this day to have the conversation and all the visionaries. I, I, just, I just say thank you. My family thanks you personally um, because we have been devastated by losing our black men and women to... Uh, to uh to of this plant so i'm just extremely grateful for you all thank you and continue to work thank you so much 
uh, Assemblywoman Jackson, it's been a pleasure and an honor to work with you in the Bronx. And we look forward to the day that we can do something um, in person. And we'll be out on the streets with you if you need us. Uh, but we look forward to that moment where we can definitely reach the peeps in our masses and our communities. To all the hosts uh, that joined us, thank you so much. And to all of our sponsors, uh, thank you again to the legal panel. You were awesome. You shared great information. Um, next steps, uh, we look to do another event uh, in June, uh, June 17th, and we'll share that information. Um, you can find us, I uh, put my email in the chat, but you can find us on Instagram at um, nycannabizcc. Uh, I think I'll put that in the chat too. Uh, but I just want to say that it was really awesome to do this event. Um, as we said, uh, I get it. My, uh, I will make sure that um, my, um, my tech person is around uh, the next time. <laughs> but I think overall, uh, this information is valuable and uh, we are more than welcome. I don't know if I missed out anything. Mikael, Dr. DeVoe, you are the bomb always. And um, again, thank you all everyone for joining us. If I missed anything, put it in the chat right now. Um, please make sure you check the chat. The chat has a lot of wealthy information, but just remember that this is just the beginning. All is new uh, and all is an opportunity for us to be better. Have a great night, everybody.